issue, that's our experience, to control inflation. The financial system but must be very well regulated and with high capital ratios to, to, to lending. Uh, competitiveness, it's very important. Uh, but the pension funds in our country has played a major role. We have a pension fund system that already reaches 150 billions for a country of 17 million people. So it's a very large amount that also we try to put that investment large part within the internal system. Uh, I want to say that all these things takes a lot of time. I, it takes years. It, change to democracy and building institution needs persistence, needs leadership, needs patience, and needs the capacity to negotiate for a long period of time. So this, your, your, your experience is very short, so we are very impressed with the speed that you are moving, but you have to take into account this other factor that I think is very important. On, on the democracy and human rights, we, we are, we, you will be extending the concept of human rights to social rights, and that's step by step. It's not something that is reached immediately, at least in our experiences. And just to finish with youngs and polit young people and politics, new coalitions, you cannot have a democracy without subjecting the military to civil power, to civil authority. That's an issue. Uh, you may have very good military that help change, but at the end, if you want a democracy, it's the civilians, it's the people that elect people that govern the country, not the military. So that's, I think, it's a very important issue on how you manage that. Secondly, you need strong coalitions because the dispersion of forces doesn't allow that, what I said before, to, op to come. But that happens in a long period of time also. We started with 25 parties. Now in our own coalition, we are four, but mostly two large ones, the Social Democrats and the Christian Democrats. And, and we had lots of differences, but we, 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 we put together in order to face the conservative right in order to do those, those changes. So the building of the coalition depends very much on the electoral law. If you have a law that is completely proportional, I think, forget it, you won't have coalitions. It would be very hard. You need to have proportionality, but equilibrated with a degree of concentration of forces, because otherwise you don't have the majority to govern uh, and, uh, and, and do things. So let me just end up by saying that uh, I, I think that uh, what happens in Egypt it's having a large impact in the world, so you, you have a, a great opportunity and a, a great responsibility for democracy in the future, uh, in all the world, not only in your region. And I would like to thank the, the moderator for his uh, moderation, the colleagues, and the translators that have done a very large yes. work, and thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, and uh, I will not repeat what my colleague from Chile has had to say. I just want to address a few things that from the questions. The first is the question of external support uh, needed for the development of the economy of South Africa. Uh, I just want to say this. Firstly, while we were negotiating, we had many overtures and quiet promises, change peacefully, and everything will be fine, we will be investing, you'll get lots of money pouring in, the road will open. It didn't happen. <laughs> Lesson number one, whatever you want to do, while foreign help is important, decide in your mind you're not going to be dependent. You're going to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. That's right. Then the rest of the help, when it comes, it comes and use it wisely. Second point, in South Africa, unlike what I'm hearing in Chile, our domestic savings are very low. We are not a, an economy with a people who's accustomed to saving. So it becomes even more important to have foreign investment come into our country. But again, we were given advice, 
follow the restructuring of Washington consensus and it will sort itself out. Don't nationalize and foreign money will come in. Privatize and it will come in. We tried everything, it didn't come in. Because always the investor is going to go where they can get the best returns. Sure. They're not going to do you a favor. So attend to your problems, take into account the need for foreign investment, be able to explain yourself, and deal with the problems that are impediments to that process as well. One of those in the South African case is related to the question of the security side of our country. Law and order is an enormous problem. And let me say this in that context. I think we have made mistakes. We minimize the problem. I think we've made lots of progress too. What are the fundamental mistakes? The fundamental mistake is that South Africa had descended into a lawless society. And I mean this not just for the oppressed, but also the oppressor. I, by 1990, never knew what it was. I was commander in the underground. I never bought a thing in a shop. I always bought it from stolen goods side. <laughs> huh? <laughs> but it started off with a simple thing that I was not going to respect laws that were immoral. From that, it went on to the struggle, which was driven into the underground. And I'm not going to go buy a car on the counter so that you can see my name when I'm an underground commander. Right? And if I did buy a car, I made a die to change the engine number. <laughs> on the other side, the rulers. They made laws, and even as they made it, they knew they themselves won't carry it out. They made laws, for example, that a white person should not marry a black person, fine. That a white and black could not have sexual relations, but their own priests were breaking the law. So you, you had a complete undermining of the fabric of a law-ordered society. And on top of that, you were taught that black life is cheap. Now you have to retrain, restructure this entire force. And in that, we, I think we've made some mistakes too. Because in retraining our police, we had to teach them for the first time what it is to live in a constitutional state. What I call the Eichmann defense is no longer available in the modern world, where you say, I carried out these atrocities because I was ordered by my chief. No. If you're a policeman, you are there to maintain law and order, and if your officer in charge gives you an order to carry out an illegal act, you have a duty in the Constitution not to carry it out. That's a difficult one to learn and teach people. And if you think it's not difficult, just think. I was Minister of Transport, my son was about 13. And at a dinner table, I raised the question, what would I do if my son stole my car at night while I'm asleep and drove off and knocked a child to death? Would I go and bribe the policeman to hide the docket so that my son is protected? Or would I leave the law to go? and do what it needs to do. I never got invited to the dinner table of those people. <laughs> so, come back. I said, we live in one world. Our challenge was to integrate with the global economy, and the first benefits of globalization came through increased trade. But in order to get that increased trade, South Africa's economy had to change from an exporter of minerals to developing a manufacturing sector. But we had to do that in the context of making rules for free trade. And the more we removed the tariffs, the more our own protected industries collapsed. 
And if you went to Washington to tell them you had problems like that, they didn't listen to you. Our current crisis, we need to get rural development going. We need a balance between urban and rural. But the trigger points in any economy are the contribution of the cities. So we're busy trying to get that balance right. And in that, we have decided that in spite of the slow flow of foreign direct investment, we have as a state to pump in money and invest in infrastructure development. Because we can't wait. So we have to find the ways to do it. Lastly, colleagues, I just want to touch on the land question that was asked. 13% of our people under race rule. Now, the, the majority of our people, 80%, were confined to living and owning land in 13% of the land surface. The white community, constituting less than 10%, was free to buy and land in the rest. How, how do we change that? We negotiated in the Constitution a Bill of Rights. And in that negotiation, we protected the owners in whatever field, including land, saying that the state will take land, but it will take it away on a willing buyer, willing seller basis. Well, as soon as we tried to repossess, the prices went up. So we've been spending millions trying to rebuy the land and redistribute. But in that, too, we had to, had to learn. We redistributed to our people small parcels of land. What was productive as a large farm now became unproductive in produ producing agricultural products for the market. Yes, you can rationalize they were now feeding themselves, so it was less mouths to feed, but the flow of agricultural produce to the markets slowed down. In the meantime, the social pressures, our farm laborers were being treated like serfs. So we made laws to protect them. But in protecting them, farmers stopped employing them. So no easy answers to these. Your conscience, your drive is the way forward. Let me conclude by making the following remark. I'm thrilled with this visit to Egypt. I wish I could go to every country where there's ferment going on from Tunisia to Yemen to Bahrain to uh, Syria. I'd love to go and meet people so that I can become young again. <laughs> but I think that there has been a message that I'm hearing. Yeah, that's... And this applies even to the democracies. There is a message in what you are doing. Even if you have a democratic system with irregular elections and multi-party democracy, all powerful people in power tend to ignore their clients. The only ones that do it is the business people because they're going to sell products. However, what you've done in Trial Square is telling me you want to be heard, you want to be listened to. You want to be included in the political, social, and economic life of your country. Thank you. Now that's a message for democracy as well. Thank you. Uh, I think with this uh, very wise conclusion of a man of experience, I on behalf of all of you, I thank the speakers, the discussants, and everybody attending this session. Uh, we said at the beginning that we cannot transplant exp experiences. Uh, we can see Chile is very close to our uh, experiment, which is taking place at the moment. Uh, South Africa is quite different, but it's more impressive. And the Arab presented their case, their common ground, and we hope that they will come together for a better Middle East. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.